trends on drug discovery and drug development. Uh, because advanced therapies is, is probably the latest of the important contributions to, to medicine and to development of new therapeutics. And uh, this is what we will talk about. As uh, my talk is quite an introductory, it's, it's a first approach to the topic. I, will, I was wondering how to do it, but I decided at the end of the day to, to do a kind of revision of the pharma, the, the history of the pharma. Uh, because this will uh, introduce advanced therapies as a logical step after a very, very long history. Okay, it works. So, uh, beginning with all, uh, the very first thing that we have to do is to keep in mind the, uh, the major focus of our job. And the major focus of our job is always me as a medical doctor, is uh, to help patients. Uh, once in, in my past, I worked for an American company called Mercer Pendon, and my boss told me that revenue comes when you develop uh, drugs, medicines that are useful for patients. Uh, any other thing is useless. So revenue is a secondary effect of developing something that is really useful and helps patients. Uh, people hear that could be directly related to medicine would know that medicine has two parts. One is uh, scientific, which is what I will talk about, and the other one that we have to always keep in mind is the uh, humanity. Is the, the need to be uh, warm, to listen to the patient, and it's as unimportant as the drug development. I always begin with these two slides because I, I like to keep the focus always in all my talks and say what we are all, we here, what are we doing here? So what are we doing here is trying to help patients and here in the left side, in the scientific area. Okay, how has been uh, drug development performed um, in the last century, for example? There is a typical or classical model, which I would call pharma classical model, in which you have very big industry firms that uh, have uh, thousands of people inside, many of them quite clever, that imagine new possibilities, new therapies, etc. They produce them, they do the first research and development, they go to the hospitals and en engage medical doctors and other staff in order to do the late development of the products, the, the clinical trials. And then the pill is ready to go to the market and be offered to patients and doctors. And this is a very long story, how we came to this classical model. It begins in the Middle Ages, quite interesting thing to review, and came to the 21st century. At the beginning, I'm not going to talk about this, but it's Quite interesting to read in a vacation, in the beach, for example, about monks, alchemists, botanics, physics, and all this, doing handmade uh, herbs and this kind of things. But <clears throat> at the uh, 19th century, it, be it began to became to became professional, and chemists were the people uh, dedicated to convert all this in a professional uh, scenario. Probably the very first uh, pioneers in this vision of creating professional medicines uh, which uh, could be de defined as medicines uh, imagined, created and developed based on data, based on science, based on real data. And the two very first pioneers probably were Merck and GlaxoSmithKline to imagine and envision this, which for, for us is quite common now. <coughs> Before the Second World War, under this vision, we had two very <coughs> important achievements, which were the uh, isolation and uh, production of insulin and penicillin. All these discoveries were not 
done at the industry were done by scientists, but the big effort to produce them in a large scale, to distribute them, all the science behind that, that it has science also, was done by two by several companies, Eli Lilly, Merck, Pfizer, Squibb, with the support of the US government. So this was the very first beginning of what we call pharma industry and the typical, typical, very typical drug discovery. Scientists in the academia or even in the pharma, imagine, imagining, isolating new, new drugs, envisioning targeted targets and so on, and then the industry making it possible for the big public. After the Second World War, we came to the golden age of uh, pharma, and uh, the most important uh, topic of this age is that the systematic identification of that drug candidates replaced chance. Because before it was like a, more of a serendipity of uh, like penicillin discovery, for example, which is very well known, uh, but then uh, uh, an effort to identify with systematic science potential targets, potential candidates for those targets began. And as a result of that, we have the several important contributions to medicine. For example, the con contraceptive pill, all the drugs for central nervous system. We have ibuprofen, we have the uh, AC inhibitors for heart failure, and so on. This was the result of a systematic effort, okay? But what happened? This was a golden age, everything was improving, but at the mid of the 20th century, we asked a very big scandal called the thalidomide scandal, very well known also. And because of that thalidomide scandal, uh, the global legislation changed completely. So, there were two very important laws, one at the USA and on the other one at the UK, that indicated that any new drug that would come to the market and offer to doctors and the public should have proof of efficacy and proof of safety with real data. And also that all new drugs should undergo animal toxicity and all what we all these pre-clinical experiments that we call, in, in drug development, we call the regulatory preclinic pack, package, okay? This was created at mid uh, 20th century because of the thalidomide scandal. As a consequence, and you can see it in the right, uh, before this, it was quite easy, more or less, to develop, to envision and develop a new drug like penicillin or insulin, because they didn't, the company didn't have to prove more than the possibility to produce the drug in factories. But with the need of doing a very large research and development before you begin to offer the drugs, <coughs> this situation elongated approval times to nearly 10 years. From the very first beginning, the discovery of the target and the molecule for the target, okay? And the cost raised exponentially to a situation that now can be between one and five billion dollars per new medicine, okay? So it, it looks like, it looks like a, a pharma industry has a serious problem to overcome this new legislation and survive and create new medicines and so on. How to do it? At the beginning, uh, they resisted with what we could call the era of the blockbusters, which was at the 70s and 80s. And the idea was to find a single breakthroughs, uh, significant contributions to medicine, um, dedicated to treat a, a wide amount of the general population. For example, to treat hypertension, 
to treat uh, cholesterol and this kind of things that uh, nearly half of the population uh, before or after would suffer of these problems. And uh, this uh, led to some, to the appearances, appearance of, of some drugs like Taragate, Prozac, quite, this, this was quite clever to, to develop drugs for anxiety and depression because these guys envision that our modern soci societies, we are not very healthy from a mental point of view. So it was quite clever to do this, this kind of a strategy and approach. Okay, so this was the way, the strategy to survive and to continue developing new drugs. But as I told you before, this is very expensive. So at the 80s and 90s, um, some of the pharma industries decided to invest money in what we call the me tools which is, uh, with, uh, after some years, uh, developed into the generic world, okay? All the generics and so on. Why? Because it is much cheaper. They just wanted to, to get market share. Uh, so if I get half of the market of the ulcer, of the peptic ulcer, I will be millionaire, you know? So I developed a very... Uh, similar, a, a compound very similar to the one that really uh, demonstrated uh, efficacy and safety, I patented and I just have a, a kind of uh, a commercial race, okay? But many things uh, with this uh, kind of strategies, there were a lot of medical admit needs that were not covered. Uh, most important ones in the area of inflammation and cancer. So at the late 20th and early uh, 21st century came up a new player, which was the development of biologics, which all, all of us we are very well aware of. And it is uh, still not on the top of uh, their curve, but it, they, they are still very, very, very important and is still developing new drugs in this context, okay? So this was a big change because the, the whole uh, mentality moved from the chemist, pure me chemist mentality to the biologist or biotechnologist mentality and way of doing things. We move from uh, aspirin and small molecules to very large molecules synthesized by living organisms, difficult to isolate, difficult to produce. Nevertheless, they offer a solution for many people. For example, Herceptin for breast cancer, which has been one of the major contributions to medicine that were done in the, in the near past, okay, for example or uh, Ertanesep or Infusimab for uh, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and all, all lupus and all this stuff. What's the problem? The problem to develop biologics is the development process which is very long because all the chemist uh, development <coughs> processes are more like, in, like engineering are, are more, uh, is, it is more possible to keep them under control. It's more predictable. But biology and living organisms and big molecules are not so predictable. So it's not so easy. You, you, you have to, to take into that account many things and uh, many safety considerations, for example, in humans, that make the research and development uh, phase um, quite long. Okay, you probably you remember the scandal of uh, in UK of uh, some people that died after the administration of a monoclonal antibody. It was uh, five uh, years ago, or it's, it's uh, RTCD 28, uh, 2006 yeah. uh, from the general mm -hmm. exactly. and 41, 42 something. Like that. Exactly. <coughs> so I know it very well. You, 
you cannot tell so clearly what they will do or they will not. You have to be very careful in all the process of research and development of this kind of compounds. And the costs are enormous. So, by now, at this moment, still uh, considering these problems of the research and development, the cost, the times, uh, biological medicines are now the major players, major innovation, most important things that we, we receive from the pharma industry, and so on. By next year, 10 of the global top 20 best selling drugs will be bio biologics. Next year. Okay? But still, very long development processes, very costly. How to deal with this? Some began to develop this century the biosimilars. Biosimilars are a monoclonal antibodies similar to the ones that were originally that developed by uh, some big pharmas like Eli Lilly, Merck and some others, and that are being marketed under, uh, well, in, in markets where the le legislation, the regulation is not so strong. Okay, not, not the FDA or EMA, okay? And uh, this market is in expansion because it's very cheap to do these things compared to develop a new monoclonal antibody, a new biologic. So the big pharma has become the big biologic in a certain way. They, they uh, from some, from one decade, they began to abandon all the chemist, all the small molecule, molecule development, and all that stuff, and move towards biotechnology. Um, this is a bit a strong tendency, but um, the answer of of the management of the big companies at this moment is um, they like and dislike this model because they like what biologicals can offer if they are successful, but it's very risky and very costly to develop these new drugs. So what they have decided to do, as far as I know, is to focus. So uh, big pharmas, has, as far as I know, have taken two very big decisions. One very big decision is to come back to the small molecule arena, to be chemists once again, because it is really a more easy to control these developments, shorten periods of, uh, of research and development, uh, very, very easy to produce these small molecules in factories and so on. Uh, uh, but they will not abandon the biotechnology world. What they will do is to reorganize that, that business in focusing in very, very specific and viable areas. Which means the big pharma uh, is not interested now in investing uh, millions of dollars in developing a biological uh, treatment for everything. A biological for hypertension, a biological for this, for that. No. They will focus in very specific uh, indications, and only those. The rest will be a small molecule. Okay? So, this is the situation. And all this, to come to the topic that uh, my colleagues will, we will talk about now, which is medical doctors still have medical and med needs. With a pharma in front that is not so interested in doing huge innovation in biotechnology for everything, okay, they will focus in very, very certain biological uh, development uh, processes and only those, okay, only, only some drugs. Coming back to the small molecule arena, big markets, no, not so complicated, the story, okay. What can we do? And 
It is because of the situation that uh, advanced therapies were born. Okay? Some medical doctors and some scientists thought about the possibility of uh, helping patients with uh, using different tools with a completely different perspective. Okay? Uh, using th cells as living organisms, alive cells, okay, administered to the patient, uh, changing genes, gene therapy, and using uh, engineered tissues. I will explain a little bit about all, the, all three concepts, okay? You can imagine that uh, developing cell therapy, which is deals with cells and dealing with genes, genes and creating new tissues is nothing that was performed before in the pharma industry. So this was not created at the farm. This was created at the small groups at the academy and some pioneers in the biotech industry. Well, biotech industry, some, some of the biotech industry is based on this technology. So at the very first beginning, at the beginning of the 21st century, it was a question of academy and hospitals. And they decided to do these things because of a specific needs of a specific patients. I have this patient with this problem. I want to help this patient. What can I do? I don't have a solution uh, with the pharma drugs that I, I have in my hands. Okay? Sorry. And they had an advantage, which was the lack of a legislation. Until 2007, uh, uh, this is this is some mistake. Until 2007, there was no clear legislation, both in FDA and in Europe, about how to develop advanced therapies, uh, how to develop a cell as a medicine a gene as a medicine or, or new engineered tissues. What is this? This is not a monoclonal antibody. This is not a small molecule. Everything was completely new. So it was, as I told you, the medical doctors and basic scientists uh, doing it handmade at their labs, at the academy, at the hospitals, and putting it directly into the patients, directly. No preclinical studies, no toxicity studies, nothing. It was done, done directly from the lab, from lab to the patient, directly. In Spain, we have some <coughs> examples of this. For example, the company called Diagenics, uh, which is a biotech, Spanish biotech, is based on the pioneer, pioneering work of one surgeon at one of the major university hospitals of Madrid that uh, developed a cell therapeutic product okay, to treat perianal fistula locally with cells of, the, of, of the, their own patient, okay, mesenchymal stromal cells. Uh, they got them, uh, the, the team, expanded them in vitro, and then injected them back. Okay? But uh, the, the source was not Perianal was living. Was uh, cells, mesenchymal stromal cells were obtained from 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 the lipid tissue, okay, of course, here, and then expanded and injected <laughs> to treat the inflammation of the perianal system. You have also the pioneering work of uh, Catherine LeBlanc at the Karolinska Institute, who treated uh, children with uh, graft versus host disease. Uh, which is a complication of uh, ke ke chemotherapy, well, not chemotherapy, complication of leukemia treatment when you inject the, the bone marrow from another person to the, to the patient and, and the T cells of the, of, of the donor attacks the body of the recipient. And she treated some kids with a severe form of this graft versus host disease with mesenchymal stromal cells leaving the sanguinal stromal cells injected directly. And she cured the kids. So this was the very first pioneering work that uh, actually opened the field. Okay? 
We have a very big enthusiasm. When I joined this uh, area of advanced therapies, what I felt was enthusiasm everywhere. Cells and genes will cure everything and all these things, which is not true, obviously. <laughs> but it, it was that kind of, of uh, we, we have a, a new power, we have new tools, and this, this was the field. But then, legislators at the FDA and EMA came. These uh, two slides are not mine, okay? I, I took them directly from the European Medicines Agency. They are public, public access. And uh, the important issue is that the EMA and also the FDA recognized that there were new medicinal products that were based on genes, cells, and tissues. Not existed before. And that could, could be revolutionary for some patients. But, as I told you, in 2007, they decided to regulate all the field. And the most important uh, message is, is that if you want to develop an advanced ther therapy product, you have to go to the EMA directly. You cannot do it through a local agency, for example, through the Spanish agency, or the French one, or the Germany, you have to go directly to the top, okay? Because they want to keep it uh, under a strict control, centralized. There is a committee a specific, a scientific committee specific to evaluate advanced therapies, okay? That doesn't exist for any other uh, product in the, in the world. There are specific technical requirements which uh, apply to everything, to the preclinical development, which is quite specific, to the clinical plan program of development, which is also specific, and so on. And uh, they also uh, require some post-authorization um, special measures, okay, to keep all the field under a very strict control. But also, IMA gives some incentives to develop this, because they, they feel it is very promising. It's something they have to invest on. It's something they, they want to develop, okay? So, very briefly, this is the uh, regulatory uh, definition of a gene medicinal product. At the end of the day, is anything, anything that acts directly on the genes of the person or the patient, okay? Replacing, adding a new copy, whatever. This kind of uh, product is a gene therapy product. For example, today, not marketed, but under development, we have uh, several viruses. Uh, Professor Dick Russell will talk about it afterwards in cancer, okay, one example. Plasmid DNA and recombinant bacteria also used to introduce immunomodulatory genes, to introduce good copies of, uh, of genes that are linked to several uh, rare diseases, okay? They change the, the genes, actually. And uh, in cancer, uh, viruses to deliver oncolytic drugs. Cell therapy is actually to obtain cells from the patient or from uh, other people, to keep them alive, to change them, if you wish, even with uh, genetic engineering, and administer alive to the, to the patient, okay? For example, we have, uh, as I told you, the mesenchymal stem cells, okay, to treat uh, an fistula, to treat graft versus host disease. Okay, we have uh, cardiac stem cells for heart failure. We have hematopoietic stem cells, as I told you, for blood pressure disease, and etc. And tissue engineering is the creation of living tissue to be put in the patient directly, and the tissue is designed and created in the lab. 
using scaffolds or other things. Have you heard about the 3D printing? The uh, okay, it's like um, you, you can use scaffolds uh, of uh, uh, biocompatible material, okay, and uh, put them cells, okay, uh, that live in the scaffold, and this scaffold can be put to repair one part of the body. For example, there are two important examples that actually work, okay? One is skin repair for bones, uh, the in vitro culture of the skin, so I was involved in one of those, <coughs> or the development of one of those. Uh, you, you can create a kind of artificial, artificial skin in the lab. It's not perfect, but it works, okay? You see different cells and scaffold and so on. And, uh, sorry, Trachea repair, there is also a pioneering work about this, okay, with uh, scaffold with living cells and so on. So, to, f to, f to end my presentation, if you want to develop an advanced therapy product for any disease, you have to consider many things. You have to consider the specific leg legislation, that the manufacturing uh, processes are also quite specific, depending on what you want to produce. Eva Martin will talk about it. The preclinical development is also quite specific. Probably Dirk uh, Basher will tell us about it. The clinical pro program is also quite specific. I will talk about it, but we don't have time. <laughs> so for next conference. <laughs> and, and all this. And the, the field also, that the field is very new. So ethical review committees, local agencies are now being exposed to these new products that look like a, a science fiction, look like a Star Trek and this, you know, this kind of uh, Star Wars. <laughs> they come here telling me that they will change a gene and what and uh, what's this, you know? So everything is very new and, and uh, they are being becoming used to it. And uh, this is the um, process that is currently uh, in place at the European Medicine Agency if you want to develop an advanced medicine product. So it's something complex. It's not easy, okay? It's not, uh, it's not easy to do. But for certain diseases, uh, we believe the ones that we work in this field that is quite promising and we hope to help patients with it. Okay, so this is it.